This fact was normally presented matter-of-factly by my mother. My father rarely told us any details. I'd get those later from my friends at school. Once, when I was in the fourth grade, a little girl with golden curls named Dreama was called out of class. I never saw her again. Her dad had been beheaded by a sharp piece of slate when the tunnel he was working in collapsed. Dad came home from work that night with his hands bandaged, bloodied from recovering the rock that trapped the men. He fired the four men responsible for failing to properly support the roof of his section. After that, no one said any more about the incident. The company required the dead miner's family to move within two weeks of the accident that killed him. Perhaps deliberately, there were almost no windows in Colwood to remind the rest of us what could happen in the mine. Mr. Dubonnet and a knot of other miners were gathered in an impromptu union meeting by the lamp house. He was handing out pamphlets. I heard you got your rockets flying, he said to me. How high are they going? One of the other miners wanted to know. You hit the moon yet? Come and see, I told him. When are you shooting them off, Sonny? Mr. Dubonnet asked. I'd like to come down and watch, but a lot of people would. I had a sudden inspiration. I could put up a notice at the big store and the post office. The lift bell rang twice and the men shuffled aboard. I'll be there, Mr. Dubonnet said as he descended. Dad came up on the return lift. Before he saw me, I watched him as he pulled out a red bandana, now gray, and coughed into it and then spat into a pile of gob next to the bathhouse. He looked up and waved me in behind him as he went into the bathhouse. He hung his helmet on a peg, stripped off his boots and coveralls, and got into the shower and started lathering up with lava soap. Why are you here? He demanded while attacking the black grime embedded in his face. Could I please have some cement? No, he answered. A puddle of coal mud swirled about his feet. What do you want it for? We need a launch pad. I thought if you had some cement that was maybe extra. The company doesn't have extra cement. Dad muttered through the spray, twisting a washcloth into his ear. The company doesn't have extra anything. If we did, we'd go out of business. How many bags do you need? Maybe four? Dad finished and toweled down. I knew he'd take another shower when he got home to scrub more coal off. The coal dust that collected in the moist skin around his eyes would remain. The miners of Colwood walked around with their eyes lined like Cleopatra's. I tell you what, he said as he toweled off. I had a junior engineer make the estimate on a walkway up at fan number three, and I heard there was some cement left over. It's rained since then, so it's probably ruined, but you can have it if you want it. Save the company the expense of hauling it out. He didn't have to tell me twice. The next day, after his garbage run, Odell borrowed his dad's truck, and he and Sherman and I went up the torturous trail to one of the big fans that drove air through the mines. There, beside the locked door to the fan controls, sat four bags of cement. They hadn't been rained on at all. There was also a pile of sand and gravel equally intact. Are you sure your dad said we could have this? Sherman worried. It's prime, I shrugged. He said the rain ruined it. What rain, Odell demanded. It hasn't rained in a month. Your dad's fooling with you, Sonny. Look, there's the new walkway, all done. They could have hauled the cement and stuff away when they finished. I considered the implication of what Odell was saying. Was dad helping us? Or maybe he'd made a mistake because he was so distracted by the football suspension and opening the new preparation plant over in Coretta. God only knew, but I didn't have time to figure it out. Come on, I said, let's load it up before somebody beats us to it. After we dug a hole in the slack and poured a five by five foot slab of concrete for our launch pad, Cape Colwood was ready for its first rocket. The blockhouse was 30 yards away from the pad on the creek bank, its dimensions determined by the lumber at hand. Quentin grandly described it as an irregular polyhedron, but it was little more than a wooden shed. It had an earthen floor 
a doorless entrance in the back, a flat tin roof, and for a viewing window, a wide rectangular opening covered by a clear quarter inch thick sheet of plastic that Odell found slightly scratched in the trash behind a big store. Mr. Dantzler used these sheets to protect his glass counters. Beside the blockhouse, we erected a flagpole, a two inch galvanized pipe discovered abandoned alongside a gas wellhead up Mud Hole Hollow. Mr. Duncan, the company plumber, told me about it. A BCMA flag sewn and stitched by Odell's mother fluttered proudly from it. I love the flag. It had the initial BCMA arched over an embroidered rocket with an owl, the high school mascot, writing on it. To open Cape Colwood, I loaded Auk 5 with our bottle tested formula of finely ground black powder and postage stamp glue cured under the water heater for five days. Because I had promised Mr. Dubonnet and the other miners at the tipple, I'd let them know when there was going to be a launch. Sherman posted a notice on notebook paper and big block letters on the bulletin board at the big store and post office. Rocket launch, the Big Creek Missile Agency, BCMA, will launch a rocket this Saturday, 10 a.m. at Cape Colwood, the slap dump two miles south of Frog Level. True to his word, Mr. Dubonnet came to our next launch, parking his Pontiac at a wide spot on the road opposite our blockhouse. There was usually a union meeting on Saturday morning, so I knew he had to hustle to make it to the Cape on time. I was pleased when Jake Mosby also showed up, driving his Corvette. Tom Music, another junior engineer, was with him. After carefully parking his car under a protective tree, Jake sat down beside Mr. Dubonnet on the Pontiac's fender and raised a bottle of beer in my direction. Tom just waved. I was surprised to see another car drive up. It was an Edsel driven by a man named Basil Oglethorpe. Jake, as it turned out, had invited him. He waved me over to introduce us. Basil had the physique of an Ichabod Crane. He had on a cream colored suit, a wide brimmed floppy hat, a black string tie, a silver vest, and narrow shoes that had weaving in the toes. He also wore a fob watch and a chain. I had never seen anyone so corporally dressed in my life. My mouth dropped open at the sight of him. Basil ignored my reaction, one that he was probably used to getting in McDowell County, and told me he was going to make me and the other Rocket Boys famous. I'm going to be your Lowell Thomas, Sonny Boy, he told me, and you, my Lawrence of Araby. Basil's with the McDowell County banner, Jake said, watching my reaction. He was clearly amused. It's a grocery store rag. We're growing, however, Basil sniffed, taking a big flowery silk handkerchief from his vest and pressing it to his nose. I am the editor-in-chief and features writer. He sweeps out too, Jake added. I thought he might help you boys get some attention. Seems to me you deserve some as hard as you've work down here at this old dump. I wondered how interesting we would be to a real writer. I couldn't imagine it. I shrugged and went back to supervise preparations for the launch. Roy Lee lit the fuse to our little awk and ran for the blockhouse. Before he got there, the fuse reached the powder and the rocket whooshed off the pad, climbed about 50 feet, and then, as if aimed, turned and flew directly at the men lounging on the Pontiac fender. Mr. Dubonnet, Jake, Tom, and Basil threw themselves to the ground while the rocket hissed overhead, then slammed into the road behind, skittering along until it plowed into a muddy ditch. It happened so quickly, I didn't have time to react. Damn, never saw men move so fast in my life, Roy Lee observed. We chased after the rocket. Sherman stopped long enough to help Mr. Dubonnet and Tom up. Basil was whooping and laughing and dancing around stopping to scribble on a notebook pad. Oh, it's just like Cape Canaveral, he exclaimed. I love it. <laughs> Jake had gotten up on his own and walked rapidly down the road. I watched as he lit a cigarette with trembling hands and took a pull off a flask. 
I went to see if he was all right. He waved his cigarette around. Seeing that rocket come at me was almost like being back in Korea, he said shakily. I'm real sorry, Jake, was all I could say. It don't mean a thing, Jake said. His fingers brought the trembling flask to his mouth. When I came back up the road, Mr. DuVernay and Tom were inspecting the rocket with the other boys clustered around him. Basil was in his Edsel, still scribbling furiously. Boys, next time I come down here, I'm going to make sure my insurance is paid up, Mr. DuVernay. Ho hoed. He sniffed at the rocket. Your powder's putting out a lot of tailings. This is black powder, right? Our own special mixture, I told him. Mr. DuVernay tapped the rocket casing and lumps of unburned propellant and ash dropped out. He smeared some in the palm of his hand. Still wet, he said. How long did you let it cure? I told him five days. I'd give it at least two weeks, Sonny. He rubbed more of the powder residue between his fingers. I worked explosives before the company brought in the continuous mining machines. Powder's got to be bone dry. After Mr. DuVernay, Tom, and Jake left, we boys gathered with Basil beside the blockhouse to discuss the results of the flight. We've got to figure out how to make our rockets fly straight, Sherman said.